start <coughs> the recording because I want to talk about this. <coughs> um, for the remainder of the semester, and I'll try to send this out today. According to what's on the original syllabus, right, what was assigned for November 2nd, 4th, and 7th, that's what we're going to attempt to do today. We're not going to get all of these poems done. Um, the rest of the section for the terms and stuff, such about poetry, we're not going to go through, just go through it on your own. Again, if it's in bold print, know what the term means, right, for those sections. So for today, we're going to do the poems, uh, To the Virgins to Make Much of Time, To Its Coin Mistress, Author to Her Book, Valediction for Many Morning, uh, My Last Duchess, Crouch Grandeur, Jabberwocky, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, and My Mistress's Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun. We're not going to get through all of those. Uh, we're going to try. We'll move some things to Wednesday if we have to. Then on Wednesday, what was assigned originally for November 9th and 11th, that's what we're going to do Wednesday. That is Ode on a Grecian Urn, Ode to the West Wind, Acquainted with the Night, Road Not Taken, and Stopping My Woods on a Snowy Evening. For Friday, we're going to do the two days, 14th and 16th. Scarborough Fair, Kuba Khan, or Vision in a Dream, Pied Beauty to One Who Has Been Long in City Pit. And for the Scarborough Fair, you've got also a uh, link to the lyrics by Paul Simon for that he and Art Garfunkel recorded back in the late 60s, their version of Scarborough Fair. Um, also, Passionate Shepherd to His Love, Nymph's Reply to the Shepherd, and you've got a link to that poem um, in The Lamb and the Tiger. Those are for Friday. We're not going to have class next Monday because more than half of you are not going to show up anyway. I, I just know that's going to be the case, so we're, just, we're not going to meet. Um, that's the Monday of Thanksgiving week, which is the 22nd, so we're not going to meet then. Monday the 28th, 21st, then. Monday the 28th, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven poems. We should be able to get all those done. My heart leaps up through, batter my heart. And then the last day of class, Wednesday the 30th, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or eight poems. And a couple of those are available via the links that are on your syllabus, okay? Um, some of the links that are on here, for example, on, on the syllabus for November 16th, we're going to read Christopher Marlowe's The Passionate Shepherd to His Love, and then we're going to read Sir Robert, um, Christopher Marlowe's Passionate Shepherd to His Love, and then we're going to read Sir Walter Raleigh's Response. And that's the one that you have the link to. On the last day of class, you're going to read... The Dover, uh, Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. And then we're going to read um, Anthony Hett's parody response, The Dover Bitch. Okay, just change one vowel. So, for today, turn to page 645. We're going to do two Carpe Diem poems. Latin phrase that means seize the day. Okay? Why? Because you don't know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. I told my first class, literally five minutes before I walked into class, class, I read an article about a shooting at the University of Virginia overnight. A student, I believe, shot, I think killed three students and was as yet unaccounted for or not found. Kind of brings home carpe diem. So, bottom of 645, Robert Herrick. To the virgins to make much of time. Herrick was an Anglican priest um, who wrote a whole bunch of poetry. Okay? So, as with all poems, 
I think I mentioned this the other day. Look at the title. What does the title tell us about what the poem is about? To the virgins, to make much of time. Page 645 in the 11th edition. Okay. Who are the virgins? A lot of people read that and they say, oh, it's got to be women. Not necessarily. You know, 50% of the population, men, 50% is roughly, you know, it applies to both. To make much of time, that is to do what you can with the time you have. So we're going to have four, I think it was four. Yeah, four stanzas, four, four line stanzas or four quatrains. Okay. And each one's kind of going to have a different image. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. So, gather rosebuds today, and the implication is that small bud that hasn't even begun to open up yet. So cut those today. Why? Because time passes on, inexorably. And this same flower that smiles today... The bud starts to open tomorrow what? Those petals will be dropping off. That's how quickly time flies. Okay? Next image. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to setting. So, sun rises in the east, sets in the west, once it reaches its PM, its prime meridian, what's the sun essentially done? Is it going to get any higher? Nope. So whether it slowly sets like that or just boom, it doesn't get any better is the point. It doesn't get any brighter. Darkness comes at that point, right? The, soon, the higher he's getting, the sooner will his race be run. Okay, second image. Third image. That age is best, which is the first, when youth and blood are warmer. But being spent, the worse and worse times still succeed the former. Page 646. Okay. So, that's talking about us. That's not talking about the sun out there. And it's talk, not talking about a flower. That age is best, which is the first, when youth and blood are warmer. You're in the best age of your life, according to that line. Why? All of you, I think it's safe to assume, are in your early 20s. I'm in my 60s. Okay? Your youth and blood are warmer. Your blood is like the liquid in this bottle. Okay? Highly fluid. My blood, according to this poem, is like bacon grease after it's been sitting for an hour. What's it do? It congeals. It hardens. It's no longer nearly as fluid as that. It, you know, you turn the pan and it will slowly drip out, but it'll take a while. But being spent, that is, that age and youth and blood, but being spent, the worse and worse times <clears throat> still succeed the former. What's the speaker mean by being spent? Used. Wasted. Okay? <clears throat> So the speaker is suggesting once your youth and warm blood are past, what is the next day like? It's worse than today. So you, the example of the poem applied to my life. Today will be worse than yesterday. And tomorrow will be worse than today. And the day after tomorrow will be worse than tomorrow. Not a very, you know, positive outlook on life, right? So, that's when we get the final stanza. Then. Then is an adverb of time. Okay? 
But what else is it here? It's like a conclusion. Therefore, thus, be not coy, but use your time and while you may go marry. What does the word coy mean? We don't use that word very much today. In fact, I don't know that we, that anybody uses it at all. And we don't see it written much. But a hundred years ago, it was used all the time. Even 30 years ago, it was used more than it is now. Who does coy usually apply to? Take a guess. Strong young jocks? No. Women. It is almost always applied only to women. Okay? Which is the only word in the poem that gives us any indication of the sex of the recipient of the poem or the intended recipients. To the virgins to make much of time? What's it mean? How many of you like, enjoy, and you don't have to literally answer this, but you can if you want. It's kind of rhetorical. When you just start, just get into a new relationship, romantic relationship. You have the warm fuzzies and all that, but what do you not know what to do? Almost everything, right? You're not sure exactly what the other person likes or doesn't like. You're not sure what are the right things to say, what are the wrong things to say, what are the right things to do, the wrong things to do. Because it seems, I'll speak from a guy's perspective here, since I obviously can't speak from a woman's, it's like navigating what? I see some grins. A minefield. Okay? You don't know what she likes, what she doesn't like. Kind of a thing. The coy, that's talking about the game, so to speak. Or the dance of love. The battle, be the other phrase that's used, the battle between the sexes. Okay? More specifically, it's getting at the idea of a woman, usually, whether it's right or wrong, doesn't matter, just how it is, usually playing what? What's the next phrase? By saying playing, hard to get. I just saw a couple guys' faces go, yeah, I know what that's like, okay? What's that mean, hard to get? I, I'm not talking sex, getting into her pants and all that kind of stuff. Just being what? A little standoffish at first? Like, come on, you got to work for it. You got to really show me. That's what's, being, that's what's implied. I read, I, I read, I wrote up here for my first class. Another word that used to describe this is coquettish. That is, kind of shy. Playing, intentionally shy, and again, right or wrong. I don't care about gender roles and all that kind of nonsense. Um, playing kind of bashful and stupid almost. Okay? So, be not coy. Notice how direct it is. Use your time. What's the time? Go back to the previous stanza. When you're young, when your blood is, is it just warm? No, it's hot. And while you may go marry. Now, go marry doesn't just mean go get one of these. It can also mean this. Go marry, go happy, go full of joy. For having lost but once your prime, you may forever tarry. Your prime, your first, doesn't mean, that doesn't necessarily mean virginity. That's what a lot of students understand it to mean. It means your 
pride of life, your youthfulness. Okay? Why? Well, go back to the previous three stanzas. What happens to that rosebud that's young? It's full of, of possibility, right? And that bud starts to open, and what's going to happen metaphorically the next day? It's dead. Why do you give... Sorry, shouldn't even say that. My own background, okay? My wife and I were dating. Wasn't my wife then. Old-fashioned, traditionalist, stodgy me. I give flowers. Why do men, some, give women flowers? Why are red roses the biggest thing on Valentine's? Why not give her a bag of socks? What are more practical? Right? I mean, socks keep your feet warm. Roses, they die. The petals all fall off. Unless you give her plastic ones, ooh, that'd go over really well, wouldn't it? Yeah. Why? Because they're young, they're beautiful, they're soft, they're silky. Okay? What's his point? Having lost but once your prime, you may forever tarry. Every one of you, whether you consider yourself handsome, attractive, ugly, doesn't matter. Every one of you is different than me, not only in age and sex and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but what else? For lack of a better phrase, all of your complexions are different than mine. Why? Because you are young. What's going to happen to each of you, okay, yeah, I shouldn't go that far. Maybe some of you have really, really good genes. Not these kind. Um, or maybe some of you know a really, really good plastic surgeon. So that when you turn 60, you're not going to look 60. But most of you don't to either of those two questions. And by the time you hit my daughter's turning 30 next week. I'll use her. By the time you turn 30, how many of you think of 30 as being old? 40? 50? I joke with my siblings, I'm the youngest, and say, because they're all like, oh, we're middle-aged. I'm like, you're not middle-aged. You're old. Face it. You're in your mid-60s. You have 20 years, maybe. Middle age is in the middle. You're on the down, you're, you know, here. <laughs> this is death, kind of a thing. His point is, what? You lose your prime. You lose that youthfulness. You use, excuse me, lose that beauty, that handsomeness, and what? You may forever, what does the word Terry mean? Wait. So what happens if you don't use it? Your beauty, your sex appeal, your attractiveness. Right? What happens if you don't use it while you have it? You lose it. How likely is it you're going to find a quote-unquote mate <laughs> or someone to mate when you're 70 and old and wrinkly and saggy and not likely that's the point so go marry go what have fun do it now because you might wake up tomorrow and it's 70 years later and you're thinking, why didn't I, you know, when I had the chance, okay? To its coin mistress, second carpe diem poem. I'll warn you right now, this one has an absolutely disgusting image. Yes, page um, 647 in the 11th edition. In the 10th, page 814. The absolutely disgusting image, sorry, ladies, it's, it's about you. It's 
not about the men, okay? <clears throat> or, well, kind of is, but you'll see it when I explain it. The poems are written in three stanzas, all right? It begins with a question, and the question is a subjunctive. It begins with a condition, all right? And then we're going to move to the future, and then we're going to move to the present, to the now. So, had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. There's that word coy again, but it's coyness. So, had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. What's the implication? A subjunctive always introduces a condition contrary to fact. What's the fact? We don't have world enough in time, right? Those three students I mentioned at University of Virginia, they thought they had time, and then somebody gunned them down last night. I don't know, pretty sobering. I mean, what a downer. Way to start the day. So this coyness, this, to use the language I used before, is playing hard to get. Because what does playing hard to get imply? I can play for a while, right? I can, you know, throw the bait out, dress one way or another. Again, and this, this can be male or female. It doesn't matter, really. Okay? I can throw the bait out, attract someone, Reel that person in and then do what? Let the line go slack again so they pull, go farther away and then reel back in and just keep doing that back and forth. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Do any of you ever remember, did you ever have a time when you were a kid, like a, you know, prepubescent kid, with friends, middle of the summer, like late July, early August, and you sat around thinking, what do you want to do? I don't know, what do you want to do? And you literally, I did, wasted an entire day not doing anything. That's what the speaker is saying. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Should we go right or should we go left? And we would waste the day. Another image. Thou by the Indian Ganges, the Ganges River in India. Side, shouldst rubies find. I by the tide of Umber would complain. Umber is a river in northeastern England. And he says, I would sit there and I would complain. It doesn't mean sit there and whine and mope and bitch about life. It means write love poetry. You'd be over there by the Ganges and I would write about my love for you. If we had world enough and time okay i would love you 10 years before the flood what flood notice it's capitalized what famous flood can you think of Noah. noah's flood when did noah's flood occur i don't mean when give me an exact date like the ninth or tenth chapter of the book of genesis Beginning of the Old Testament, beginning of the Bible, really, it's within a few hundred years of what? Maybe a thousand at most. Beginning of the world. Okay? So, way, 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 way back in time. I would love you 10 years before the flood. And you could do what? And you should, if you please, go ahead, honey, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. Well, according to most Protestant theology, he's an Anglican Protestant priest. When are the Jews converted? Not till the end of time. And even then, it's not all of them. 144,000, according to traditional reading of the book of Revelation. So, from 10 years before Noah's flood to Jesus coming again in glory, you could go, no. I don't want to. And I'd be, that's cool. Why? Because we have all the time in the world. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. All that's meant by vegetable 
is slow growing. Plant a pumpkin, plant a squash, plant a watermelon. They take three to four months to grow and produce ripe fruit. Very, very slowly. So, and his vegetable love would grow vaster in empires and more slow. And then he uses the new image. He's going to start cataloging her beauty, kind of. Okay? A hundred years should go to praise your eyes and on your forehead days. I think that's a hundred for the eyes and forehead together. I could be wrong. It could be a hundred for the eyes and a hundred for the forehead. Okay? 200 to adore each breast. So notice he starts at the top and he starts to move down. And notice the years increase. Why? Because that's what he values more. 100 for eyes and forehead, 200, assuming she's formed naturally, 200 for each breast, so 400 years for her breast total, okay? And 30,000 to the rest. He's moving south. Tells you what he values the most. An age at least to every part. Notice an age is not defined by time. And the last age, oh, isn't this sweet, should show your heart. Because that's what he values the most. For lady, you deserve this state. Nor would I love at lower rate. What does rate mean? Rate my professors. What does that mean? Judge. Annual percentage rate. Judge. Judge. Okay. But judge how? What do you do when you rate your professor? Whether on that website or like, you know, you're going to get an email sometime in the next week or so about doing classroom evaluations. Do it on your phone, do it on your computer, whatever. What do you do? You select numbers, right? Four, five, three, one, zero, whatever. Okay. Those are rates. But here, it's like an economic term. Honey, you're worth at least 50. Yeah. That's, mm. That introduces uh, bad thinking, in my opinion. Okay? I don't know. Maybe you like it. So how does the stanza end? He ends with that. And then we get to second stanza. But, but always indicates some kind of contradiction, some kind of contrast. But at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. Notice time is doing what? It's hurrying, it's near, it's catching up. What happens when time catches up with you? You die. So, he hears time's hurrying chariot, so he's trying to move faster. In yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. It's meant to rhyme, all right? How many of you think of Eternity, if you think of eternity at all. How many think of eternity as the Sahara Desert? Or the Mojave Desert? Death Valley? Dry? Dead? Scorching hot? Most people, this is a generalization, most people, when they think of eternity, they think of it in terms of a place. Heaven or hell? Which of those descriptions, dry, desert, scorching hot, is those one of those locations? <laughs> Amaya's going, that one. It's hell, right? You don't think of heaven, you know, I don't know, unless you're a Bedouin who lives in the middle of the desert or something. Think of heaven that way. 
Yonder before us lie deserts of vast eternity. That kind of implies eternity is what? Dead. Dead. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. In eternity, you won't be beautiful. Nor in, what's her marble vault? What's that referring to? The mausoleum that her bones are interred in or that her body is put in, the grave, okay? If you're wealthy, you can have your body put literally in a marble like house okay and he says and in that vault you're not going to hear me singing why not because just as her body will be in the grave his body will be in the grave too we'll both be dead then <laughs> what's the then when your body's in the grave, disgusting, foul, rotten, piggish, male chauvinistic piggish image coming up, okay? If it doesn't turn your stomach, there's something wrong. Then, worms shall try that long-preserved virginity. What's meant by try? Test. Prove. How do worms prove or test her virginity? Because they go where he wasn't allowed to. They go in and out where he wasn't allowed to. Notice what the speaker is assuming about the object of his love. Well, if she doesn't give it up to him, what? She's not giving it up to anybody else. You know, itsy beatsy bit egotistical there. Foul image? Oh yeah. Is this, you know, is this the kind of line a guy, you know, sidles up you ladies, sidles up next to you at a bar, frat party and something, and says, uh, hey, I think I'm gonna try this. Maybe it'll help me get lucky. Uh probably not. In your quaint honor, turn to dust. What's her quaint honor? Her honor that is tied to her virginity. Why does he call it? Why does he call it quaint? It's nice. It's fastidious. It's scrupulous in that sense. But also, your textbook does not include a footnote. Okay, when I teach this in my uh, my Britlet one course, the textbook in the last 20 years has started including a footnote. It's the only textbook I know of that does. I don't know if, if it's because somebody told the editors, did I point this out in my class? I have no idea. I've never heard anybody else point this out. That word quaint is related to the Middle English quainta, Q-U-E-Y-N-T-E. That Jeffrey Chaucer uses in a couple of his poems in the Canterbury Tales. And in those tales, it's talked about a guy who grabs a woman by the quinta. And this guy, by the way, in one of the, the stories, the wife of Bastille, this guy, uh, excuse me, the Miller's Tale, the guy is described as Henda Nicholas, which some translators call that gracious. Gentle Nicholas doesn't mean that. I mean, that is a meaning. It means handy. He's good with his hands. Look at that word quainta or that one. What are the three consonants? It's the modern English. It's where the modern English word comes from. Okay? Foul. Dirty. <laughs> So, in your quaint honor, turn to lust and into ashes all my, uh, turn to dust and into ashes all my lust. Notice, how can honor turn to dust? I mean, literally, it can't, right? 
Because honor is what? It's a conception. It's an idea. Dust is real. It's physical. So something else is turning into dust. And into ashes, all my lust. Again, his lust is something conceptual. But ashes are real. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do their embrace. Probably an allusion to a poem by John Donne called The Relic where a, a thing is dug up from a grave, okay? There's a bone, I think it's a wrist, in fact, it is a wrist. It's a man's wrist that has a bracelet of golden hair tied around it. Well, there's another body in the grave, too. It's a man's and a woman's grave. They're buried together, or one shortly after the other. And the relic is this indication of their love, all right? He's saying, no. When you're dead, what? You're dead. End of story. Now, therefore. So, had we but world enough in time, we don't. In the future, we're both going to die, and there's not going to be nothing left. Now, therefore, what? While the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew. The youthful hue, that beautiful, glorious complexion that you have, that glow. Well, what happens to morning dew? What's probably already happened to that frost that was on the ground this morning? Sun comes up. And it evaporates. Sun comes up to your life, in your life. And what's going to happen to that beautiful complexion that you have in your early 20s? You're going to look like an old hag. That's what's going to happen to it. Your face is going to get all wrinkly. Your hair is going to turn all gray. It's going to fall out. But now, now... It sits on you like morning dew. And while a willing soul transpires, now let us sport us while we may. What is the speaker saying about the beloved? Three words. You want me. That's what the willing soul transpiring means. It oozes out of every one of your pores. So, now what? Let us sport us while we may. Let's jump in the sack. Let's have fun. Rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapped power. That is, somebody used a phrase in my first class, had to do with time. Time flies. So? Louder? When you're having fun. Time flies when you're having fun. In other words, it goes by quickly. And you what? You don't notice it. Okay? He's saying, let's make time fly rather than languish. What's it mean to languish? To lie in pain and agony and moaning and complaining in time's slow chat power. How many of you have ever been really sick? I mean, like near deathly ill. Time, when you're like that, it just rather going tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, it goes tick. It just really slows down. Now, he says, let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness. Uh, excuse me. Now let us sport us while we may. And now like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour. Birds of prey? He's comparing love to eagles and falcons and kites and hawks. 
Is that a flower? Bird of paradise is a flower. I don't think bird, I've never heard of a bird of prey. Bird of paradise. I mean, I knew, that's like a weird one that comes up and has like a together. stalk and has like a, uh, a beak looking thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, birds from Miami. Um, not stork. Pink. Flamingos. Looks kind of like a flamingo. Um, no, he's talking about raptors. Because it was a Renaissance commonplace, a Renaissance notion, that raptors made it by flying high up in the air, and the male would melt the female, and then they would drop. They would stop flapping, they wouldn't soar, they just pull their wings in, and so he'd be on top of her, and the ground's getting closer and closer and closer and closer, and she's going, hurry, 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 hurry. What's happening? Time. <laughs> Really fast, right? As you fall. So he says, let's roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball. Let's get so intertwined that we are like a single ball. And do what? Tear our pleasures with rough strength through the iron gates of life. That is, let's wear out time. He's not talking, I've literally, I once had a student write, about, you know, the pleasures with rust drive. Oh, he's talking about S&M and bondage. And and like, no, no, not at all. He's just saying, let's like die through sex. Insects. Not I-N-S-E-C-T-S, but I-N, pause, S-E-X, okay? There's another Renaissance notion, commonplace, that every time you have an orgasm, a little bit, a little bit of you dies, and so you'll see poets say, "Kill me, kill me again, kill me more." Okay. Though we cannot make our sun stand still, biblical allusion, Joshua, the city of Ai, back in the book of Judges. Yet we will make him. We're going to get so busy, we're going to make the sun have to work to catch up to us, okay? Carpe diem, right? It's really seize the day, seize the time while you can. Go from there to a very, very different kind of poem, 692, the author to her book, okay? This is in the section on metaphors. The author is Anne Bradstreet. The book, I think there's a little introductory comment. Yeah. The book is her first volume of poetry. This is the bottom of 691. Titled The Tenth Muse. Okay. Published by her brother-in-law in 1650 without her knowledge. All right. If I remember the story correctly, he took, like, say this is a manuscript, okay? He took a manuscript copy of her poetry, like a blank book, and she's written, filled it with poems. Took it to England, had a printer publish it, brought it back to the United States, okay? Tenth muse, according to ancient Greek culture, there were nine muses. Each muse was the inspirer of a different kind of literature. History, philosophy, poetry, different kinds of poetry, etc. She's the tenth muse. In other words, there's a new god of poetry, or goddess, if you want. Okay? So, he brings it back and he shows it to her. He gives her a copy of her poems, now printed, with the name Anne Bradstreet on the title page. Six, the author to her book, 1678. This is 28 years after that book was originally published. Okay. And the implication is, she now puts this poem kind of like a frontispiece, a preface, prefatory poem to everything that's going to follow. Why? Because the whole poem is an extended metaphor of her poems as children, okay? 
Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth didst by my side remain, till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view. So, notice, ill-formed offspring of my brain, not of my body. How are they ill-formed? She's suggesting these poems weren't ready. And they stood by her side. Okay? Or they, after birth, after their creation, stayed by her side. Like, she had this book of poetry and she kept it in a drawer. She didn't share it with others. Till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true. Her brother-in-law wasn't very wise for taking it, but he was being true. True how? Loyal, faithful. This is um, 692. Okay. Not loyal in the sense that he did what she wanted him to do, but loyal in the sense that he was like, this is great stuff. And Bradstreet, by the way, is the first American poet. So, he snatched, who took thee abroad and exposed to public view, made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not lessened, all may judge. What does that mean, made thee in rags? Well, that's kind of implying the clothing of the children. Well, how can poems be in clothing? How they're presented. How they're written. It could also refer to the kind of paper that they were written on. Paper made of cotton fibers. See, not all paper is made out of wood pulp. All right? So the poems went to the press where errors were not lessened, all may judge. That is, in the act of being set in print, errors crept into the poems. This happened commonly in the early days of printing. I mean, for the first couple hundred years. One of the reasons for that is because the printer did not have something like this to work from. It was what? Handwritten. How many of you are really good or have really good penmanship? I'll bet almost none of you do. For the simple reason, school stopped, stopped teaching handwriting 10 or 15 years ago. Eh, longer than that. Okay? Handwriting was an art that was taught in this period, but her manuscript book of poems probably had things crossed out and things handwritten in. And they were like, what does that say? I'm not sure. Okay? So errors increase. At thy return, that is, when the brother-in-law came back from England with a printed copy of her poems, my blushing was not small. Now, she might be blushing for more than one reason, but she tells us, my rambling brat in print should mother call. By Anne Bradstreet. Okay? Rambling. What does it mean to ramble? I mean, how long did I spend talking about Carpe Diem in that first poem? Probably longer than I needed to. Rambled a bit. That is, losing focus, not staying on point. She's applied that to her poems. A lot of her poems are about the same subjects. Her husband, her children, her marriage, her family, her home life. Okay, kind of. That's what she writes about. She writes about the stuff she knows, her life, okay? I cast thee by as one unfit for light. And I think that she's telling us she hid her poems because she didn't think they were worth anything. We're going to read another poet who never really published anything in her life. And she's regarded as one of the greatest of American poets, Emily Dickinson. Most of her poems were found on scraps of paper in her house when she died, okay? 
She tried to publish them, she couldn't. So, I cast thee by as one unfit for light. Thy visage was so irksome in my sight. I didn't like how you appeared. Yet being mine own, but also, by the way, that I cast thee by as one unfit for light may refer to the manuscript, her handwritten poems. It could also refer to as the published book that she got it as like, should never have been done and put it away. But the implication is at this point in the poem, yet being mine own at length affection would thy blemishes amend as so I could. In other words, it's out there, it's under my name, what should I attempt to do? Fix them, improve them, make them better. I washed thy face, but more defects I saw, and rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. Did you ever have a time in school, you're taking an exam or something, and you keep making the same error on the same spot in the page? And you erase and erase and erase, and you rip the page? Anybody ever do that? <laughs> Math test, but all the time. I stretch thy joints to make thee even feet. What? Even feet. Okay. Notice I stretch thy joints. Like one leg is shorter than the other. So she wanted the feet to be even. She's using feet in what sense? Metrical foot. Okay. In a line of poetry, the poetry has the line of poetry has a certain number of feet. That is rhymed and unrhymed syllables. A rhymed and unrhymed syllable is one metrical foot. So if you have five rhymed and unrhymed syllables, so rhymed unrhymed syllable, dun dun, dun dun, dun dun, dun dun, dun dun, you have ten. Uh, you have five feet. Okay, ten syllables. Iambic pentameter is da 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 Five feet, ten syllables, with that rhyme, pod, uh, unaccented, accented. So she says, I tried to even that out. Some of her lines only had nine syllables. Some of them had eleven. Often when you'll see in a line of poetry, an apostrophe with S, all the poet is doing is removing the vowel so that you read the two together. It's rather than it is. Why? Because if I have it is, it makes the poem too long in terms of the number of syllables. So, yet still thou runs more hobbling than is meet. She didn't get it quite right. She couldn't fix all the lines. In better dress to trim thee was my mind, but not save homespun cloth in the house I find. I tried to fashion you in a better way, she says, but all I had in the house was homespun cloth, meaning rustic material. Homespun cloth, that is the cloth she uses to make the clothing. What is the matter of her poems? The things in the house. She's not writing about kings and queens. She's not writing about famous events or famous people. I mean, one of her poems is about her house burning down and the calamity that that was. Another poem, if I remember correctly, is about one of her children who dies in, in infancy. Common occurrence back then. In this array, in what I've prepared for you, in what I've improved, Amongst vulgars mayst thou roam, vulgars, everyday, ordinary, common people. In critics' hands, beware thou dost not come. Don't fall into the hands of an English professor. Why? Because they're going to rip it apart. Don't fall into the hands of, an, of a literary critic, because they're going to say, this is garbage. Okay? And take thy way where thou art not known where yet thou art not known. She's from Massachusetts. She's saying, get sold in Rhode Island. Get sold in New Hampshire. Why? Where people don't know me. 
where they can't go. That's Anne's child, her creation. And if for thy father ask, say thou hadst done. You know, immaculate conception, so to speak. And for thy mother, she, alas, is poor, which caused her thus to send thee out of door. Why does she suggest, last couplet, she consented to publish the books, the book of poetry, with this poem in it. Money. I need some money. Okay? That's pretty much it. Go from there to... What's time? We don't have time. A valediction for bidding morning. We'll do a valediction for bidding morning on Wednesday, along with the remaining... Along with the other poems for... Wednesday. We're not going to get them all done. Everything that's on the syllabus will show up on exams and quizzes. Don't forget, drama exam due tonight. Um, I'll probably put up a quiz over some of the terms for poetry and the poems through today. Okay? That'll be due the earliest Wednesday, probably Friday. We'll have at least three more quizzes. Right, at least three more quizzes. Final exams only on poetry, except for extra credit. That can come from anywhere.